Welcome to Wide Mindedness with Victoria Ball, the podcast in which I interview expert guests who want to join me in celebrating that life is not black and white. Our society is increasingly divided, and the us versus them mentality seems to dominate our conversations and relationships with others. I believe that life is much richer when we widen our minds to consider multiple opinions and perspectives. So challenge your assumptions and let's become truly wide-minded together. In this episode, I am joined by Rupert Wesson, the Academy Director at Debretts. Debretts is a professional coaching company, publisher and leading authority on modern manners. Debretts first published The Peerage and Baronetage over 250 years ago, and today they continue to share their expertise in social skills and building confidence through the Debretts Academy and a range of publications providing authoritative guidance on matters of British and international etiquette. The Academy is much in demand all around the world, coaching businesses, private clients and schools in social and interpersonal skills. Hello, Rupert. Victoria, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. And of course, I'd love to ask you some questions about Debrett's and how that relates to wide mindedness. But I thought we would just start off by asking you uh, how you would define etiquette. We have a very simple definition of etiquette, but actually (laughs) simple um, isn't always super helpful. But broadly speaking, the simple definition of etiquette is it is nothing more than care and consideration for others. So in a social situation, that means putting other people at ease. It means putting other people's needs before yourself. Uh, The the longer definition, it's often helpful to explain what it isn't. Um, And etiquette isn't a set of rules, and it's not this thing about having to know which which knife you use with the fish course. That's, That's not really what etiquette is. There's also a perception that etiquette is British, Uh, And in many ways, the the clue is in the word, which isn't a British word. It's it's important to say that every group, every society, every culture, every subculture has its own etiquette. So etiquette is culture and context specific. Um, It's highly subjective. And and even in one set of circumstances, some people find one form of behaviour selfish, self-regarding, where others find it perfectly acceptable. So it is subjective. But fundamentally, if you can get etiquette right, it's a great way of conveying respect. And it's a great way um, of starting a relationship by having a uh, good understanding and a good attempt to convey what you perceive to be the right etiquette for that situation. So if etiquette is putting other people at ease at its core, what can we practically do to engage with people who might be quite different from us, might come from different backgrounds? For me, it is about meeting meeting people in the middle ground is often a, often a good way of thinking about it. So where you, and even if you think about the first moments where you, you meet people, and if you're talking about two people meeting from different cultures, one person might want to shake hands and the other one might want to bow what invariably happens is you both shake hands and bow at the same time mm-hmm. and that almost is a, is a good example of, of how you you adjust your behavior to, to meet in the middle and generally speaking when you're going into somebody else's set of circumstances so again if we're talking about cross-culture when you the, the great phrase about when in Rome it, it that idea is that that you adapt your behavior to meet what is is normal for that set of circumstances so that's a really Um, good point in terms of wide-mindedness because it is all about considering the other person's perspective where they're coming from what might be influencing their decisions absolutely and and you have to to go into each and every situation with your eyes and your ears wide open and be curious as well it's something that sometimes we forget to do I think we think we know it all and I think that's that's it those people who who are the most curious are typically the ones who have the greatest flexibility. They have the greatest range of behaviours and that allows them to adapt more quickly, to connect more quickly. There's a great, um, there's a great sort of um, interpretation, I would say, of, of, of what Darwin said is, 
um, it, that actually what he was saying is it's it's the most adaptable will survive. Uh, and I think that's that's actually true in terms of, of human culture, human behaviour, as it is of anything else. Hmm. McKinsey recently released a study saying that 31% of the current workforce is lacking in communication skills. And they also said that those skills, those soft skills, those interpersonal skills, are going to become far more important uh, in 10 years from now. Do you see examples of that in your work, that we've forgotten how to communicate with people, particularly people who might be thinking differently from us? This is um, yeah, a constant um, a constant theme for us. <laughs> at, at one level, there are just a lot of people who, who want everyone else to sound like them. And when they come across people who don't sound like them, they say, oh, goodness me, people have got no ability to communicate anymore. The ways in which the number of channels in which we communicate have changed um, and communication has become more more rapid. What's interesting is in, in many ways we communicate more in the written word now than we have done at any time in the past. And um, because we're, we have this, this ability to communicate so frequently in the written word, that sort of thing has become much abbreviated and you only have to look at text speak and emojis to, to, to see that. A lot of people say, oh, emojis, yes, they're, they're terrible. They're, you know, where are we going with this? But actually emojis are a great way of communicating. And emojis have become fundamentally very popular because they allow you to communicate an emotion with just one click. So that if you think something you're going to say could be misinterpreted, you can you can put a for example a smiley emoji on it, and 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 it's it's there to to show that this is a positive message or that that you are apologising for something with the the apology emoji, the hands together mm. uh, emoji. So. Actually, we communicate in different ways. It under, fundamentally, communication is about what people take away, what people understand. This lovely idea that um, if if people aren't, if, if, put brutally, if people aren't doing what you want them to do, it's it's not them that's at fault. It's it's you for failing to communicate it. Mm. So, um, one level, yes, I think. Um, communicating across generations and I, and I often wonder when people like McKinsey do studies whether they just ask the senior managers can the junior people communicate and of course they invariably say no of course they can't. I'm really pleased you mentioned the intergenerational thing because when we talk about divisions in society people tend to look at gender or ethnicity but I think generation is a really important and overlooked division in terms of diversity. Lots of young people say they find it really hard to know how to start up a conversation with an older person because they think they have nothing in common. What tips would you give to someone in that situation, either an older person or a younger person? It goes back to the idea I think you touched on earlier on about curiosity. Hmm. And, and to feel that you have nothing in common with a fellow human being seems to me a crazy idea. And you can almost be selfish about it in one sense, which is to see if you can find something that you want to hear about um, and, and then draw that out of the other person um, in the sense that um, if you can you can find a shared interest, something that you're comfortable to talk about, because when it's something you're comfortable to talk about, you're probably comfortable to listen to somebody else talking about it as well. So this idea of finding common ground. The other thing is try not to back anybody into a corner because none of us give of our best when we're backed into a corner. Um, conversation isn't just telling people stuff and then them asking, and then, then the other person telling us stuff. It's, it's a genuine interchange. And, 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 it, and to circle back to the original point, curiosity absolutely lies at the heart of this. We need to be genuinely curious about each other. And, and as you probably know, the more curious we are, the more we learn. And of course, the more interesting we are to other people, if you're interested in the other person, you immediately become a lot more interesting. Absolutely. Uh, and the Americans have a great expression about, um, you know, it's not just about uh, about pitching the baseball, it's about receiving a few as well. It, yeah, it has to be a genuine interchange. Closed questions, i.e. those questions that can be answered with, with one word or yes or no, they're a good, safe place to start, but they don't get you very far in a conversation. And it's 
it's about trying to uncover things and and i i often walk away learning learning about things that i hadn't realized i thought i thought or i knew when i've been talking to somebody who is genuinely curious and that that in itself is quite a an empowering thing i love that idea that curiosity leads to us challenging our own assumptions yes and um and i think it's good that um that we challenge our own assumptions it's good that other people do it and here we get onto slightly tricky tricky turf i sense these days it's getting harder to challenge anybody and particularly around the subjects that traditionally are more sensitive such as politics for example mm. but with a little care and attention um, a little attempt to, to to build a bit of rapport a bit of trust and understanding before moving into those subjects and again by asking questions with genuine curiosity rather than thinking you know the answer before you ask the question and and being ready to shoot the other person down. Going back to that idea of asking a question with genuine curiosity will encourage them to speak honestly, openly, freely. And and the conversation is so much better for that and you you will learn so much more. A lot of people feel that our society is increasingly divided. This idea of us versus them, young versus old, rich versus poor. The criticism of etiquette is often that it only applies to people within a social group. But basically, people say it's for snobs. <laughs> is there an etiquette that can unify all of us? Only if we take it to that original definition, the idea of care and consideration for other people. Nobody has a monopoly on etiquette, though there are a lot of people who think that the British have a monopoly on etiquette. But as I say, every group, culture, society has its own etiquette. There are a, a number of people um, I meet occasionally, many of them who teach etiquette, who who have in fact weaponized it. Um, mm. And they've used, they use it as a, uh, they use their unbending version of what etiquette is as a as a tool for judging people as a stick for beating people who do things differently for themselves and for me etiquette is everybody has their own version of it and the greater effort we make to understand other people's etiquette their way of doing things their way of seeing things their way of thinking about things the easier it is to connect with them. Mm, and you've mentioned this, but I'd love to just draw out that last point a bit more. What benefits do you think we can expect to to gain from connecting with new people and listening to those stories, experiences and opinions? Politics is always a, um, a very, has become a very heated area of debate. And I think if we if our version of politics is simply naysaying, shouting down anybody whose views are different from our own, the quality of the discussion, the quality of the discourse is is hugely diminished. And I think you end up polarising matters where they need not be polarised. I think it encourages fewer people to compromise if you if you create these very binary approaches to things. And I think if we we take the view that that there are two sides to pretty much every argument, um, and I think the more time we spend listening to the other arguments, the the more we will understand about people. But actually, the easier it, it then is to reach reach a compromise, um, and, and actually that way um, we can we can move things on and and, and spend less time discussing discussing the binary argument the yes, the no, the stay in, the the leave, whatever it might be. And the more time we can then focus on on the minor stuff and, and, and create a create situations that are going to be better for everybody as opposed to perfect for one side of the argument. It's interesting that you reference stay in or leave there. I'm sure, although this is a topic that you know I've I'm has been very close to my heart for a long time. I suppose it's no coincidence that I'm launching this Wide Mindedness podcast after years of living through the Brexit um, polarisation, you mentioned that word, that has created big divisions in British society. It's worth noting that we're recording this during 
the coronavirus lockdown in 2020. And I can see that the incredibly divided society that Britain was even just a year ago has fundamentally changed in a matter of weeks. Is that something that you've noticed as well? It's interesting. I guess at the moment, I guess we're spending more time listening to the media and less time talking face to face Mm. with um, a huge variety of people, the people we would bump into in our everyday life, the family, friends, colleagues. And so I think we're seeing things through a bit of a a media filter now or or a stronger media filter Mm. than ever there was before. I I hope you're right. (laughs) (laughs) You're more pessimistic than me. Um, no, I am. I am by nature an, an optimist. I think. Um, I think we will have to wait and see uh, when things get back to um, something akin to normal. When when restrictions are lifted, when we circulate a bit more, let's see what what has actually changed. Have you got any tips? I know you run training courses yourself. Have you got any tips for how we might become more wide minded? despite the fact that we are isolated in this unusual period? What could we do to make sure that our minds are staying curious, to make sure that we're still engaging with other perspectives, particularly when that media lens that you mention is so prevalent? I think it is important to understand that that your, your response to the lockdown your and your reality is likely to be very different from a lot of other people so people who live in the countryside have a very different reality to those who who live in the town I mean even something as simple as those people who have a garden versus those people who have have a a flat without a garden I think your your quality of life is is hugely different those people who live in a community where they know their neighbors and they can talk to them as they pass them um, or, or even talk to them out of a out of a window. Those people will have a, a much better quality of life, and I think this this period might be an opportunity for people to to realise how lucky they are um, with where they have access to the things that I, I just mentioned there. This mm. human contact, this outdoor space. Uh, I think it might also be an opportunity for people to realise how different um people experience society i think i think mm. this has brought it into sharp relief um, and, and actually in that sense a lot of the media coverage has been very good from that point of view is that it is it is highlighting those people who are finding this period incredibly difficult um so i'm, I'm optimistic in that that sense what what advice do we give I, I, it is of course to to think about other people rather than just yourself it's to look out and, and yeah try and put yourself into other people's shoes and understand understand what their reality is and and try and find a way of connecting people with people um as as brits we we're quite a dialed down race um we take a little while to get warmed up mm. and and i think as we go out whenever the restrictions are lifted in whatever form they're restricted lifted um yeah, we don't have that opportunity to shake hands. So I think making eye contact, smiling with the people we meet in everyday life is going to be even more important than it is already. Mm. I think that's a great point. It is going to change how we physically interact and it is going to put a greater emphasis on the things we can still do because just because we can't physically touch people, it's going to be really important and is important currently that we don't I I personally don't like the phrase social distancing. I prefer the phrase physical distancing because this isn't a period where we should shut ourselves off from the rest of the world. It's a period where we have to find novel ways of how we connect and communicate with others. Yes, Uh, we're a very, we're a hugely inventive um, society and a very inventive, inventive country and people's responses have been, been phenomenal. And, and the, all of a sudden, I think it's fascinating how all of a sudden we're, we're valuing things that we previously took for granted. And, and I mean, the health service is the most high profile mm. example, but, but all of a sudden people who are prepared to deliver things to your yeah. door, all of a sudden they become a, um, a, a real um, 
bonus for some of us and, and frankly a life lifesaver for other people and and these the people who provided the service before previously were were almost invisible uh, and i think one of the positives is we will we will now look and value that perhaps more than we did previously i agree in that sense i think our minds have been widened to the people that fill roles that make our lives possible uh, finally, I would just like to ask you to sum up in a couple of lines why wide-mindedness is important for you. I ask this of all of my guests, and I was thrilled with when we first connected about you coming on the podcast that it seemed to be something that really chimed with you. So in a couple of lines, why is wide-mindedness important for you, and what do you see as its major benefits? Answering that question simply from, from the point of view of the company I work for, De Bretts, where etiquette is fundamentally our... Um, it's 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 almost the product that we sell, mm. and I can make a very clear connection between the idea of etiquette and wide mindedness. Etiquette is about understanding what um, what allows you to connect with other people, and I don't think you can properly connect with other people, or certainly not many people, unless you have this this idea of wide mindedness. Rupert Wesson, what an absolute pleasure it has been. I'm thrilled you could join me on the Wide Mindedness podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Wide Mindedness with Victoria Ball. Help others learn about it by rating, reviewing and subscribing. For more great wide-minded content, follow at Wide Mindedness Victoria Ball on Instagram, at Wide Mindedness on Twitter and sign up to the monthly newsletter at victoria-ball.com.